This is Bloomberg Law. What does a prosecutor have to prove in order to get a RICO conviction? Tell us why the Solicitor General is sometimes referred to as the 10th Justice. Interviews with prominent attorneys and Bloomberg legal experts. That's Jennifer Kay for Bloomberg Law. Joining me is former federal prosecutor Robert Mintz. And analysis of important legal issues, cases, and headlines. Is the toughest hurdle for prosecutors proving Trump's intent? Alito took on Congress, saying Congress has no power to regulate the Supreme Court. Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. Welcome to Bloomberg Law. I'm Amy Morris in Washington, in for June Grosso. June will be back next week. Now, today we'll learn more about the case against TikTok and what's driving the push to get ByteDance to divest. We'll also look at the Kroger Albertsons merger and the government's fight to block that. But first, generative artificial intelligence has radically transformed the world of digital images. You want to make a website or a video? You can use an AI program to quickly convert your idea into an image. But you could also be unwittingly risking copyright infringement. Let's bring in Brian Moriarty. He is a principal at Hamilton Brooks Smith Reynolds and specializes in intellectual property law and counseling. He wrote a column about this for Bloomberg Law, and he joins us now. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Let's see if I understand this. When we're talking about AI and images, the new image that I and my AI might have created can't be copyrighted because the AI is not human, but that same image might also violate a copyright because of how the AI may have acquired it, and I might be unwittingly liable for that. Is that about right? That's that's completely right, and that was our the point of the article, which is you you think to yourself, well, I can. Um, uh, there's the the AI machine that I use. Uh, I'm I'm very visually oriented. I like to create images. Uh, you know, partly because I'm a trial lawyer. I like to use exhibits. I like to get, communicate with images. So you can say, show me Snoopy and Charlie Brown walking in the um, in the fall with leaves falling, and you, they will produce an image that may look just like Charlie Brown and Snoopy. And you think, oh, that's cool. Everyone loves Snoopy and Charlie Brown. I'll use this image. Well, that's where you have to stop what you're doing, because you will know that Charles Schultz and his empire, whoever owns Peanuts now, has copyrights on every Charlie Brown image, every Snoopy image. And there are, you know, we can all actually envision in our mind, oh, yeah, I remember a picture of Charlie Brown and Snoopy with the great pumpkin patch. And I think they were walking in the field and there was all these cool leaves. Maybe they were in watercolor. And you say to yourself, gosh, my new AI image just looks just like that. Mm. Well, when you say just like that, that those aren't the legal words of copyright infringement, but that is copyright infringement. Well, let me stop you right there. What if you had gotten uh, uh, asked AI to do an image of Charlie Brown water skiing? I'm almost positive I've never seen that before. Does that still infringe? It probably would if it's Charlie Brown, because what the cartoon images that are famous probably have broader rights than work by an unknown author because they have a certain um, equity in them, if you will. Mm-hmm. Because people, when you look at the image, the first thing you say is, that's Charlie Brown water skiing. You don't say, that's that's a... A picture of a boy water skiing. Interesting. I, I like it. You're you're going to focus on Charlie Brown, and that Charlie Brown is copyrighted. But the the issue for us is more of a business point of view. If you're a water skiing company and you're going to start a marketing campaign and you have this picture of Charlie Brown water skiing, well, you, you may get sued for that. Now that AI has entered the picture, that adds a new facet to this. How has that changed things for you as someone who specializes in this kind of thing? Does it make it more complicated? Does it really tangle things up for the person who is unwittingly infringing on copyrights? It does. Well, first of all, copyright is actually in the U.S. Constitution. Right. And it had a long history of that in, in the English common law. No, copyright rights have been around, as you say, forever. Uh, but it, it changes it, it changes the copyright picture because people will now use this. It's a fun new toy, and it's very, very useful. Um, we can 
we can all create images for our business purposes without hiring an artist. We don't have to pay some artist to do it. Hmm. And we we don't really need need permission from anyone. And so we we make these rights. And there's a um, there's a whole industry out there that you probably don't know about. These are some people call them troll lawyers. Mm -hmm. And they'll they'll and and it's particularly prominent in the area of photography and images. They will sue you without any notice or warning that you've engaged in copyright infringement. Um, if, if you take pictures from somebody and you publish them, you can be liable for copyright infringement. And so, but AI is, you know, will make more images more available more often. So this industry of copyright troll lawyers is going to keep busy and keep attacking people for um, in lawsuits. How has the law kept up with AI? Do you foresee new laws coming or laws that might have to change to manage these issues that come along with artificial intelligence sort of putting our ability to post other people's work or to use other people's work and slap our name on it, sort of put it in hyperdrive? So can the law keep up? Does it need to keep up with that? Well, there's there's a major litigation in San Francisco now. And San Francisco is probably the home of you know, it's not probably it's the home of AI and computers and, and the whole industry. So it's appropriate that this litigation is there. And it's a massive litigation. There are a group of lawyers suing, representing authors. And they're, they're also representing image makers. These are different cases. The, the authors are typically involved in copyright theft of their text and, and their expression of ideas. And image makers are more interested in the theft of their images. But there, the court is definitely changing the law now and trying to sort out what is really an infringement and what is not. And they're very difficult issues um, trying to figure it out. The, the cases we've talked about are more obvious. If you, if you go use AI to create an image of Charlie Brown, you're probably going to have a major problem. If you go take an image of, of some image of some character that's in a Hollywood movie, you're going to have a problem because the people that make those images protect them and they go after infringers. But it, it, when you take it to the next level, you're like, well, Charlie Brown water skiing, the example you gave, that's not anyone's image. But then you get into the problem. Everyone knows it's Charlie Brown. You're trading off that image of Charlie Brown and you're using it for your own purposes. That, Think you're just Charlie Brown is copyrighted. Maybe the water skiing part is, but his his big bean head is definitely <laughs> copyrighted. Everyone knows what his head looks like, and and you you probably quiz like fifty people are like, yeah, I know he wears a shirt with a black zigzag stripe, and he's got like three hairs on his head, and he always looks depressed, and you know. Is, so if you if you do that, but the laws are going to change it to to your question, yeah, for sure. I was going to ask because the we keep coming back to the Charlie Brown image because it's easy, um, but at the right. same time, everybody knows what it is. Is that the bar that has to be met? The, the test is pretty simple. Is the, is the in, alleged infringing activity substantially similar to the copyrighted work? So the first thing is the work has to be copyrighted. It's very unsettled with um, just using your voice. Um, you know, to take it a step sideways here because it's easier to uh, do. There's a lot of um, fine artists, you know, painters, and that there's an industry where the computer looks at all their paintings and says, well, this guy uses this style of brushstroke, and when he uses crimson, he always, he always uses yellow next to it, and the computer, the AI computer, can mimic what the artist does. So they go out and sell it and they say, well, um, you know, we, we can't use an old artist because like Picasso or something like that, because they probably don't have copyrights anymore. But say a modern artist, they'll sell pictures. This is in the style of artist X. And people are like, oh, that's great. I love that guy's style. The problem is the, the original artist who's the source of the style, he doesn't get any money. Right. Because he, he has no copyrights that AI created something very similar to his that's not his art of his work, but they copied his style. So that's one big issue that's actually going to be litigated is 
mimicking someone's style so closely that people believe it's him is that copyright infringement and right now that's an open question wow so this is not anywhere near complete we we've got a long way to go with this right well you you have you have lawyers and fighting and then you know the when you think about it the real image making industry is hollywood and and the media and they put a lot of time and effort to make their images. That's their business. So they're not going to sit back and say, oh, well, you know, he just copied it once. You, you know, they they will fight you, as, as you probably know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> AI is turning into the full employment plan for attorneys everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, a lot of like the plaintiffs in that case, they call the AI um, infringement machines. Yeah. It's a little bit over the top. Oh, wow. But um yeah, but also keep in mind if, you know, the other point is you can use AI to create images nobody's ever seen before. They're not like anybody else and they're yours, but you can't copyright them. Right. Got it. Um, so so it, it, it does. I mean, the, the overall view of AI is it can create a lot of uh, new images that don't have copyright problems. The problem occurs is when they're way too similar to what the prior images are. And I, I don't know if you want to get into the training sets. It sounds to me like, as far as the law is concerned, this is a work definitely in progress that's only just now getting started. And from what you've told me, and set me straight if I'm wrong about this, it sounds like the legal profession mm -hmm. is beginning to realize that AI is going to change at least a chunk of how the laws work because of the speed and the efficiency and the um, the the way that AI works in its own in its own right. You follow me? Yeah, there'll be changes. I mean, the copyright law will be the same law, but how it's applied and understood as applying to images will get tweaked, and the the courts need to create a standard that everyone understands so they can use it. Yeah. Um, but they'll, you know, what will happen is the San Francisco case. Maybe in a year or so, they'll issue a big pronouncement about what they view the law as. That'll go to the Ninth Circuit, which is the California Appeals Court. Uh -huh. And then it, that case or similar case will probably go to the Supreme Court. who will ultimately start deciding what the contours of AI and copyright are. Our thanks to Brian Moriarty, a principal at Hamilton Brooks Smith Reynolds, specializing in intellectual property law and counseling. Coming up, TikTok's day in court and later, how the Kroger Albertsons challenge is redefining the grocery store. That's next on Bloomberg Law. I'm Amy Morris, in for June Grasso. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grasso from Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Law. I'm Amy Morris, in for June Grasso. TikTok getting its day in court, a case that could have big implications for the get tough on China mood that is sweeping through Washington. Arguments began this past week at the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in TikTok's challenge to a law that would ban the social media app in the U.S. unless its Beijing-based parent company ByteDance sells it. And now we bring in Bloomberg's senior editor for technology and strategic industries, Michael Shepard. He's going to set us all straight on how this is going down. So, Michael, is that part of the argument, what we had said before, this get tough on China sentiment that's helping drive this push to get TikTok off of our phones unless ByteDance can give it up? Amy, you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, this really is part of the larger concern about the national security risk posed by China to the U.S. And in this case, uh, policymakers have been arguing uh, for, for several years, really dating back to the Trump uh, administration, that TikTok poses a risk to national security on two fronts. First is that TikTok, which we all know and uh, many of us love, um, it, it gathers a lot of data on its users so that it can power its algorithm to very specifically tailor the videos and other content that are powered directly to users. That's been the secret of its, its success. Mm -hmm. And that data is something that policymakers here in Washington fear could be taken back by its Chinese owners and shared with the Chinese government. The second concern is about the use of the platform as a means to convey 
Chinese propaganda to users here. Maybe not directly in terms of propaganda, but more subtly in, on various issues, say the war in Ukraine or what's happening in the Mideast. The concern is that China may be able to use the platform to influence public opinion here. Okay, let's break all of that down, if you don't mind. Let's get into the national security concerns. Let's start with the propaganda. That's the last thing you mentioned. Do they have any evidence that that has been happening? Have they started to see any of that? That sort of trickling out. And how does that work anyway? Well, that's a great question. And that is one of the arguments that TikTok has been putting forth. Where is the evidence? First of all, justify this law that would require uh, a, a divestiture by January 19th. I, that's not much time to sell an entity as big as TikTok. And the company has been arguing that, wait, you in Congress, as you passed this law, did not show enough evidence that this kind of manipulation, either the use of data or misuse of data, mm -hmm. was happening or that there was some sort of uh, fiddling with the algorithm uh, to favor China's government in one way or another. They're saying that evidence wasn't there. However, there were classified hearings held in Congress where members of the administration from the national security community briefed members of Congress. And members of Congress emerged from those uh, meetings and said, yeah, we really need to act. However, that evidence was never really shared publicly in a public forum for uh, national security concerns. They, you know, there are sources and methods that the government wants to protect. And in court, the Justice Department filings that refer to this evidence, they've been redacted. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what will the public get to see and how much of that will actually fully be shared in court? It sounds like there are a lot of geopolitical implications here anyway, that part of the broader struggle over tech between the U.S. and China, and this is a big chunk of it. Does this just represent the bigger mountain, or is this the mountain? Uh, this is part of the mountain. Uh, that's a good way to put it, because there are so many areas where the world's two largest economies, the U.S. and China, are competing uh, in terms of technology, but also in terms of just uh, just globally in the Pacific Rim in the global south and the, we, we see it for instance in uh, uh, hard technology like uh, semiconductors and other sensitive equipment uh, you know some of the components that would go into electric vehicles the US is looking into restricting uh, the presence of Chinese products for electric vehicles into the US uh, so all of this fits into the larger uh, uh, challenge and competition between the U.S. and China right now. And you had mentioned that this dates back to the Trump administration when he first started talking about TikTok being a threat to national security. I remember that. Have we seen issues about this before the Trump administration, or is TikTok a relatively new on this scene? TikTok's relatively new on the scene, and it caught the administration's eye uh, around 2019, 2018, 2019, and uh, members of Congress also started paying attention. And it was late in the uh, Trump presidency that he actually signed an executive order seeking to ban TikTok. Mm -hmm. However, that was voided in court because uh, lawyers for the company were able to successfully argue that uh, the president lacked the authority uh, to be able to issue and carry out that executive order. The, the order wasn't written well enough to survive a court challenge. And similarly, the state of Montana also attempted to ban the app. Uh, that, too, was overturned in court. What they've tried to do with the law as uh, written in Congress and passed as part of a broader foreign aid package in, uh, in, in April, mm -hmm. um, they have tried to make sure it was sound enough to survive a challenge on First Amendment grounds, as we're uh, seeing unfold now. Well, that's what I wanted to ask about. Do they have the company ByteDance? Does it have a legitimate First Amendment argument? That was an issue that came up in court pretty vigorously. And the arguments from TikTok's lawyers were greeted with some skepticism by the three-judge panel uh, here at the court in, uh, in Washington. Uh, one of the questions that came up was, well, if it's is it really a Chinese company or is it a an, an American company? And if it's a Chinese company, does it have the same legal protections? Uh, that was one of the questions that came up. And one of the judges was musing about you know how far these 
protections extend to uh, you know a, an entity that is in essence um, tied to a foreign adversary, in this case China. Uh, the U.S. government lawyers uh, also were uh, subject to some tough questioning, and what they wanted to emphasize that th- is that they were not going after a specific company, an entity. They were going after the actions and the conduct, and their concern is that because of the Chinese ownership and the potential ties to Beijing and the the risk of China's government uh, stepping in and asking for data and somehow using the platform, Mm -hmm. it is really more those actions that is uh, causing the U.S. to call for a, uh, a divestiture. And short of that, if they can't sell the company, then the app needs to be banned here in the U.S. When you talk about divestiture, and I think I've heard you talk about this before on Bloomberg Radio, and that is how ByteDance would divest itself from TikTok would actually destroy TikTok. It would have to because of the algorithm, right? Well, that's it. And, you know, in a normal sale, you would take, you know, all the parts that that make up the company Mm -hmm. and sell them to the buyer. But in this case, uh, the company at least is arguing that its algorithm is inextricably linked with the parent company, ByteDance. So you can't really disentangle the TikTok algorithm from ByteDance. And the Chinese government has also said, look, our uh, best technology, and in this case, the algorithm is quite sophisticated and and advanced when, uh, you know, compared to social media peers, uh, they don't want to see that sold because just on an economic basis, it can be quite lucrative and uh, and, and effective in doing what it, it does to be able to reach users out there. So what came from the most recent hearing on this? Our sense was that uh, the judges looked at this skeptically. And one of our colleagues on Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, Matt Shettelheim, his view was that it was not a great day for TikTok in court. And it doesn't augur well for them to be able to uh, prevail in overturning the law. Now, that's not a guarantee. This is really based on the way the questioning unfolded during the hearing. Mm -hmm. But our reporters, uh, you know, certainly heard all those exchanges and came away with the sense that the judges were much more skeptical of the ByteDance and TikTok arguments in the governments. Okay. I'm just going to lay it all out there. I don't have TikTok on my phone. I think I've I've aged out, (laughs) basically. (laughs) TikTok really does appeal to the younger set, does it not? It, it really does. And in fact, what's interesting is that TikTok, uh, when when you go out and do a public opinion survey, as Pew Research just did, mm-hmm. um, it, it does hold a wide appeal. Uh, 17% of uh, people in the U.S. get their news from TikTok. Oh, yeah. That's what they say, a new uh, study that just came out. And... Uh, from a year ago, we're seeing far fewer people supporting a ban. Only 32% of people in the U.S. now support a ban, uh, and that's down from 50% a couple of years ago, also according to Pew. Uh, so we're seeing the popularity. And its appeal with uh, younger users is something that has caught the attention of the political campaigns. Former President Donald Trump has his own TikTok account, which he has been using. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris uh, over the summer launched launched her TikTok account in connection with her campaign. And even former Pre- even President Joe Biden, while he was still running and had his campaign going, had a campaign version of TikTok. They know that it is a way to reach that coveted demographic of younger voters whose enthusiasm really could make a difference in the November election. Doesn't that tangle this up a lot more, though, when you have those world leaders you just mentioned using TikTok, this app that they may have to enforce a ban of in this country, while they have the younger sect of their constituents loving the app, not wanting it to go away. And then at the same time, it looks like the app is really facing some legal challenges that it's not going to be able to meet. It is wrapped up in so many contradictions. Uh, And uh, Donald Trump himself represents that because as president, he signed the executive order saying he would ban it. More recently, he has come out and even told our reporters during an interview we had with him uh, over the summer, um, he no longer supports a ban on the app. And in part, it's because he sees it as a viable competitor to uh, Meta platforms, offerings of Facebook and Instagram. But you really do see the challenge that these uh, top-level policymakers have. They don't want to alienate a younger 
part of the uh, population and right. the electorate, but at the same time, they have to respond to and acknowledge a national security risk. So the way the Biden administration officials, uh, and including the, the vice president, have put it, look, we don't want to ban TikTok. We want TikTok to be uh, you know, up and running and serving all the users here in, in the U.S., but it needs to be sold. Is this heading to the Supreme Court, kind of all but certain? It is written in the stars that it will head to the uh, Supreme Court. The uh, company in the Justice Department have asked this appellate court in Washington to rule by December 6th so that there's enough time for one side or the other to be able to make an appeal to the uh, nation's top court. And you would see it uh, center around this fight over national security versus uh, the First Amendment protections. What a mess. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) All right. Bloomberg Senior Editor for Technology and Strategic Industries, Michael Shepard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, now that a judge has ruled Google's search engine a monopoly, what happens next? That's just ahead on Bloomberg Law. I'm Amy Morris, in for June Grasso, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Law. I'm Amy Morris in Washington. June Grosso is off. And a federal judge in D.C. last month ruled Google's search engine is an illegal monopoly. After a 10-week trial, prosecutors alleged that Google paid billions of dollars to companies like Apple and Samsung and Mozilla to be the default search engine on their devices. Now, this is expected to impact Google and how competition may work on the internet. The Justice Department is considering what punishment to ask for, including whether to break up Google. Bloomberg legal team leader in Washington, Sarah Forden, joins us now to kind of straighten it all up for us. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Can the Justice Department break up Google? So the Justice Department is currently pondering what remedies to ask the judge to impose. And they are scheduled to make a filing where they will lay out to the judge what they think needs to be done. And then the judge is going to hold a hearing. So this is a whole second phase of the trial um, that's going to start next year. And one of the options on the table um, is to ask for a breakup. Mm -hmm. So it could be something like breaking off Chrome or breaking off Android. But there are other options uh, that they're also considering. Um, They're very interested in all the data that Google gets from these search searches. And they, they, they are compiling all of our data and, you know, running it through their machines. And that is one of the reasons why they're the better search engine, for example, because the other search engines have not been able over time to accumulate the same quantities of data that Google has. So so one um, option that they're looking at is looking at whether th- do Google could be forced to license the data to other search engines or share it with other search engines. So there may be some innovative proposals uh, coming on the table from them. So every time, this is a little sidebar, but every time we do a search on Google, they're gathering data on us? Absolutely. I mean, the data has really been at the center of a lot of the agreements that Google has signed over the years, and uh, they've been working on this um, for over a decade. Mm -hmm. They had exclusive contracts uh, with uh, news publishers. Um, The the contract at the heart of this search case is the contract with Apple, so that every time that somebody makes a search on their iPhone, all that data goes to Google. So does Alphabet slash Google, do they have any recourse when it comes to this? Or do they have appeals or is this a done deal? And now they're just waiting for sentencing, so to speak. So they can appeal it. Um, and one of the issues that is going to be addressed is whether they uh, need to wait until the whole process is finished, including a remedy, or whether they can appeal it uh, preemptively before a remedy is put into place. Okay, so this is still very definitely active. Very active, yes. What about the tech companies that Google did have those contracts with? With. You mentioned Apple. Do they have a role in all of this as far as could they be held somehow liable or something? So they're not implicated in this case, but they you know they were getting twenty billion dollars a year from Google to um, have them as their as their uh, default search engine. So certainly there's there's a monetary implication um, if that deal gets unwound. 
This sounds like a mess, Sarah. So this this is really a landmark ruling that has the potential to redraw um, a lot of the dynamics in the online marketplace. So it's going to be very interesting to see, as you point out, not only what happens to Google and whether it has to be broken up or share its data, um, but what happens to Apple, what happens to Samsung and some of the other companies that had deals with Google. Um, it could also offer new opportunities for uh, companies like Bing, for example, which Microsoft, you know, poured millions of dollars into Bing and never really got it off the ground. Right. But if this case opens up, you know, access to data for Bing or or um, browsers like DuckDuckGo, um, Mozilla, so there there there's a potential for this to spawn actually a new kind of cadre of competitors in the search space. So the idea is to level the playing field as much as possible, even though Google has owned the playing field for so long. Exactly. Is this what happens when a company becomes so so big and ubiquitous. Google is a verb, of course. I mean, it's in our regular lexicon. So is this the sort of thing that happens when a company becomes so big and so ubiquitous? Or is this how a company becomes so big and so ubiquitous? That's, they figured it out. That's a great question. I, you know, I would say both. Um, they figured it out. Uh, they were able to evade any kind of regulation. Um, you know, the FTC opened an investigation into, into Google um, in 2011, uh, but that was shut down three years later with with no, no recourse, uh, it was a, a voluntary settlement. So, um, you know, if you trace back the roots of this case that we're talking about right now, yeah. it goes back even to that period and uh, the things that Google was able to do after it had escaped scrutiny, um, you know, putting more product searches in front of, of consumers, um, you know, rechanging all of their um, reviews. They were scraping data from Yelp. Uh, so they, they, they really had kind of a free reign over the Internet. What are you watching for in this case? What's the next step that's going to So now we're watching the second trial. So it's interesting that you know we have the, the landmark ruling in the search case, um, but the Justice Department broke, broke the Google investigation, which was a ma massive one, into two parts. And the first part, which was the search case, was actually filed um, by former Attorney General Bill Barr under Trump. Uh, and so that's the case that we have the remedy um, hearings coming up on. Uh -huh. The second case looks at the digital advertising market. Right. And it looks at how Google um, owns all the tools that underlie the display advertising market. And so that is actually ongoing right now in a federal court in Alexandria, Virginia. And that case should last probably another week or 10 days. It is not lost on me, nor is it lost probably on our audience, that this is such a massive antitrust case that it had to be broken up into two things, searches and ads. That speaks to how big this truly is. Yeah. And they're related, too, because some of the, the ad tools also are connected to the search um, process. So uh, the DOJ is, is looking to to show, uh, prove to the judge that Google ha not only has a monopoly, um, we would say a chokehold over how these um, ads are placed, but that each of the three tools that, that create that pipeline um, are monopolies in their own right. So um, it's a very interesting case. They've called more than 30 witnesses in just two weeks, and uh, we're preparing to hear um, now Google's side of the story. Okay, we're going to shift gears now from cyberspace to brick and mortar. Uh, speaking of big companies, a merger pending between Kroger and Albertsons. A little bit more down to earth, but still huge. $20 billion merger creating an enormous, I don't know, grocery store enterprise. It's going to create this enormous behemoth where we can shop. How is this redefining the concept of the grocery store? So this is the biggest supermarket merger ever. Um, most of the grocery store brands that you're familiar with would be coming under one roof. Um, the FTC has sued to block it, saying that it's anti-competitive. And it, uh, there are several things at the heart of this case, but they're really looking at how do we define a grocery store. So um, the FTC is arguing that this is a merger of what we call traditional grocery stores, uh, which is your one-stop shop where you can go and buy everything from milk to produce to uh, dry goods. Um, the companies are arguing that there's so many other places now where people shop that it's unfair to call this uh, uh, you know, an uncompetitive merger. So you can buy milk at a 7-Eleven. Uh, you, yeah. you can buy you know, 
Um, you can join a, a club like a Costco's. Uh, you can go to Walmart. Uh, so so the, one of the, the first things the judge is going to have to decide is what's the definition of the market? And that's really key to any, any antitrust trial. Oh, wow. So uh, what is the government's concern then with this? If, we could, if I could buy my um, milk down at the 7-Eleven without having to go to a Kroger Albertson's behemoth, what, what is their concern? So the biggest concern is really what's uh, happening in regional markets. Um, and it's, it's so, um, uh, the, 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 the implications are so serious that we also have several states that have filed their own lawsuits. So for mm. example, in Washington state and Colorado, the attorneys general, the attorney generals in those states have filed their own lawsuits. Um, because it means that you might have rural communities where you have uh, you know, an Albertsons on one corner, Safeway on another, and if if these companies merge, one of those would probably go away. And so creating people, food deserts is that a concern? You could have food deserts. You can have no um, breaks on price increases um, if they all belong to the same owner. Oh. And so the concern is that this could actually be really bad for for consumers in some of the most remote areas where they would maybe have to drive, you know, sixty miles to buy a gallon of milk. So they're not only concerned about um, the the prices for the consumers, but then I would think the the paychecks for the people who work there. Also, and this is one of the first cases that also defines unionized labor as a market. And Whoa. so, um, and this is really kind of a part of the the FTC's um, expanded focus, antitrust focus. Um, to include labor issues. And they're saying that it makes it harder for unions to negotiate for their contracts if you know, these companies um, you know, come under one roof. So what happens next? Is this ever going to come to fruition? So what we what we just saw wrap up in Portland, Oregon, uh, was actually a preliminary hearing. So the FTC had filed um, to a federal judge to keep keep the two companies separate while they then pursue their own um, trial in their in-house court, which is scheduled for, for later on. But it, de facto, this preliminary hearing becomes kind of a mini trial. You know, it's like a trial in a bottle because both sides call witnesses, they present evidence, and the, if the judge, um, if the judge grants this preliminary injunction, that means that the companies won't be able to close and it could effectively scuttle the deal um, because it would take so, so long to get through than the FTC's administrative trial that they're way past their, you know, um, deadline for the deal. If the judge grants the preliminary injunction, I mean, doesn't grant the preliminary injunction and decides that the companies are free to close, um, then that makes it much harder for the FTC to prevail at their own trial. So if the judge doesn't act fast enough, then this is a done. This is dead in the water anyway. Exactly. What's going to happen, Sarah? Well, there's uh, it's it's also complicated because there are two other trials um, that are going to play out. We've got the trial in Washington State um, that's brought by the Washington Attorney General and the one in Colorado. So this this there's a lot uh, riding against this deal right now. Okay, so not only would it be the biggest merger ever in the history of grocery stores and in that industry, but and not only do you have the federal government bearing down on them, but you also have states as well. You have states as well. Exactly. And it's also proven to be a very expensive deal for the companies. Um, they've spent over $800 million uh, already just in you know their efforts to try to get this deal done. So I wonder what's on the other side of this deal that makes it worth spending that much money and that much time. Well, I mean, the companies argue that they'll be much more efficient. Um, they will be. They are also saying they're not going to raise prices. They're saying they're not going to close stores. Uh, they're not going to fire workers. So uh, for them, it's it's really about economies of scale and becoming bigger and more efficient. Okay, we're going to check in with you again about this. This is too much, too interesting. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. Bloomberg legal team leader Sarah Forden. Our thanks also to Bloomberg senior editor for technology and strategic industries Michael Shepard and Brian Moore with Hamilton Brooks Smith Reynolds. And that does it for today's edition of Bloomberg Law. I'm Amy Morris in for June Grasso. For more Bloomberg Law analysis and interviews, you can head to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the Bloomberg Business app. Just download the latest edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Stay with us. Your top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now. <laughs> 